I'm honored to be here and to be invited uh, to talk about my journey in journalism and in publishing. Um, actually, it's the first time I am invited to talk about my experience and career. I did a lot of presentation, my book, my reports, but no one asked me to, to talk about my journey in, uh, in journalism. So thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me for this. Uh, Actually, it's a mixed honor because usually this honor is uh, reserved for people with gray eyes, uh, gray eyes and uh, their life is uh, half empty or something like this. So probably you, you did an exception in my, in my case. <laughs> so, uh, well, I will give you some uh, brief uh, notes on, uh, on the beginning of this journey and uh, on, uh, on the reason why I, I choose uh, to write and uh, to research. Mm. And uh, that is, uh, this is my, oh, oh, doesn't function, okay. This is my first uh, message. Do not choose to be a journalist if you do not know what you would like to write about first. Follow your feelings, your thoughts, and craft your way to the media, or the kind of media that serve uh, your purpose, not and never the opposite. Don't follow a career, follow a feeling, a passion. I was born, as uh, John said, not Neil say, in 1950. And uh, my personal quest or passion for truth started uh, at the time when many in my generation were waging uh, a struggle for democracy, for student rights, to stop violence and uh, racism and exploitation of other human beings. At that time, also now, but at that time in particular, was the end of the 60s. Mainstream media and newspaper often described our demonstration, our meetings, our thoughts, our feelings, in a way that was just the opposite of what I witnessed. And uh, I felt, uh, I remember still now, to have felt very outraged uh, and betrayed by adults, by supposed uh, very, very big journalists hmm, that were supposed to, to inform uh, the general public uh, of what was uh, happening, what was the reality. Hmm. Instead, uh, they, they wrote and uh, they published stuff that were just the opposite of what we believe was the truth. Then, because the title of uh, this uh, talk is uh, The Quest for Truth, I would like to, to tell you what is my idea of truth before uh, going on uh, other, other uh, issues. A personal, non-scientific, of course, uh, and very limited answer is that uh, we begin to learn uh, what truth is uh, when uh, we feel uh, that particular uneasiness uh, that accompany uh, lying and knowingly misrepresent uh, your ex and uh, the ex of other that you are witnessing. So we start from a negative point. We, in some way, we know what lying is. And uh, as a kid, uh, we lie so many times that uh, we become expert in, uh, in this uh, matter. And uh, maybe step after step, uh, we became also expert in recognize when other people lie. In some way, we craft our way to the truth in this negative way. You know? The truth is uh, the opposite of what is uh, our feeling when we lie. 
not maybe a, 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 a great answer to this uh, problem, but uh, there are 2,000 years of answer of what is the true and all the philosopher and so and so. But uh, uh, usually, true in journalism, in research, in science is defined as uh, what is supported by sufficient evidence, strong evidence. And uh, this evidence is uh, put out for uh, others to check, to verify, to criticize. So a true statement is something not that you believe to be true, but something that is supported by evidence that others can check, especially in science. No? The experiments need to be reproducible. Uh, another science should be able to reproduce your experiment with the evidence that you gave to. And in some way in journalism uh, is, uh, is the same, at least in good journalists, good uh, journalism. Uh, actually, at that time, we, I, learned uh, sometimes the hard way uh, that uh, there were highly reputed journalists, adults, experts, able to ignore the reality and the evidence uh, and uh, calmly, convincingly, and uh, smoothly tell or write a mountain of lies. And I was starting to think how, how these people that are uh, adults, that are experienced people and very well paid people want to lie. What is the purpose? Huh? We were not uh, doing something wrong or something that was, uh, I mean, uh, violent. Or that was my start. Why these people would like to lie? And what we have to do to counter them? A lot of uh, my colleagues, my friends, uh, Never, never, never uh, stopping. We were never stopping to complain and complain against uh, the lies of the mainstream media. <coughs> Part of us instead uh, found that these complaints were worthless. You do not achieve anything. You just achieve a good discussion uh, in a bar. And so part of us think that we have to build our media to tell the, public, the public our truth and forget about the people who wanted to lie. We wanted to be out in the public and tell our truth. So that, is, uh, that was the reason because uh, I, with other guys, founded this, uh, this uh, magazine when I was uh, 17 years old. And was very successful because uh, we write uh, in the same way that students thinking and still that we are used to talk. We didn't use uh, complex uh, issues or complex uh, arguments. Uh, we just took how they were talking uh, in the school, in the college, uh, and we were really very, very successful. You may uh, see here This photograph was taken by uh, November, November 23 or 21, uh, 1968 in Cremona, my city. And uh, uh, my newspaper organized with other organizations uh, this demonstration, one of the thousand demonstrations that we organized. But that was particularly su successful. There was thousands and thousands of students and other, and other people. And this photograph was reproduced. This, this guy was one of the editors of the, of the magazine. And I was talking to this, uh, to this crowd. And uh, someone took, took this picture. And 30 years later, in the anniversary of uh, 1968, uh, a local newspaper republished this photograph that I have lost, of course, uh, during all my travel and all my stuff. So you can see, you can see there who real young people, you can note that the, we were a bit different mm, at that time with the pale, with the sweet. Uh, that was uh, normal for us, uh, 16 year old, 15 years old. Uh, we have all this uh, jacket and uh, that was uh, the, the, the use at that time. In 
in a few years, hundred uh, thousand of magazine journals uh, were uh, published and uh, founded and uh, and uh, and distributed in Europe, in the United States, independent media, alternative media. We learned how to collect money. Uh, for supporting the publication. We lied about the number of copies we were selling to potential, potential advertisers. So we, we learned uh, to have all these tricks. And also we spent uh, endless nights to, to discuss the article that had to be published uh, and, uh, and also to, uh, to deal with uh, the real job, with the typographers, with the, the primaries and uh, to learn how they work it, mm? concrete, concretely, mm? and uh, to respect their experience. And that is, uh, is uh, for sure you know, but that is a very useful experience, uh, passing from uh, the press room to the primaries where workers work and do some experience on this. So when now I am requested to proofreading my stuff or uh, uh, to have an idea how you can page up uh, a page. Uh, I know. I know from that time. Hmm? And that uh, was, in my career, very, very useful, useful stuff. We have uh, no money for paying uh, distributors. Hmm? So for us, distribution was uh, synonymous of, of uh, early, early rising and uh, rushing uh, with the bikes or motorbikes uh, to the place where we were selling our, our magazines, uh, factories, uh, school, college, whatever. And uh, I probably have never had, uh, again, a, a, a feeling like when you see that all the boxes are empty, that you have sold everything you have printed, that you have finally the money for printing another issue. It's something that uh, engages you in a way that uh, I really remember, I still remember something that mm, was really, really satisfying. This is our stuff. We crafted it and uh, we distributed it and uh, we convinced people to buy, to buy our stuff. But the, the best feeling was when uh, you learned that other people were discussing the articles, your articles or uh, uh, the articles of others. <laughs> that some people were fuming about what we had written, and other people smiled. You know? When people uh, met me in the street and say, oh, oh, good article, good article, ah, oh, oh, this guy was, uh, you have the courage to write this kind of stuff, uh, was a very big satisfaction. No? Uh, yes, now I, I don't meet people in, in the street, they say, oh, go. <laughs> but, so that was the, the first and the only time. <laughs> However, one thing that uh, uh, I started to experience uh, was uh, the power of writing and the connection with the changing, changing uh, things. Uh, experiencing that uh, some articles, some uh, writing had an effect in the, on the reality that people reacted to this, that people responded, hmm? not only for demonstration, but also doing real job in the school, in the colleges, uh, on the indication that you gave to them was another great, great satisfaction. And uh, something that uh, drove me to think that uh, is never unusable, your writing, your job, even if you don't think that there are thousands of people that are reading your stuff, but uh, that was really a strong, uh, a strong feeling for me, and a, a very good, uh, a very good experience. Yeah, mm. it was precisely at that time that uh, we learned how difficult it is to write a balanced article a substantiated article, and uh, we'll uh, learn uh, uh, how much evidence you have to put in an article in order to be credible, and in particular, in order not to betray the people that trust you 
with uh, some unbalanced or uh, uh, excessively partisan or uh, maybe not uh, sufficiently supported evidence. And also, we learned that uh, actually in writing, the devil is in the details, in your knowledge, in your skill, in your uh, capacity. And uh, that was the first time I think about uh, becoming a researcher. Because only, only with serious research, you can be a good journalist. And uh, you are your end. Before the censorship, before uh, the trouble that you experience in a journalist career, uh, the, f the first enemy of good journalists is yourself, mm? your lack of this expertise or your lack of these uh, this, uh, skills. So I, as John said, uh, I started to, to research seriously, and uh, my first interest were in uh, these uh, social democratic parties in Sweden and in Scandinavia in general. I went there, I studied, I learned uh, how to, uh, I learned the difference between writing articles and doing academic research. That is a completely different kind of thing. And I started to understand what kind of evidence is acceptable, what kind of uh, academic acceptable evidence you need to, to put in your, uh, in your stuff. Then uh, step after step, uh, I become interested in uh, economic policies of developing country, and there I found how they were dependent mm, on natural resources on one side, and on the other side, on our freight transport, on our financial institution. So I started to, to look at this stuff. And for many years, I didn't publish any, any kind of things uh, like, uh, like articles, but only on journals, on uh, academic uh, publications, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on this stuff. So I, I, spent, a lot of uh, I spent a lot of years uh, in uh, uh, publish something that could, could resist the time, could stand the time. When I go back and read uh, this stuff uh, that I wrote in, uh, in the 80 or in the late 70, I still appreciate the fact that they stand, they stand the time. And uh, uh, later, as uh, already told by, by uh, John, uh, I had the opportunity to work as a consultant for this uh, Italian uh, international group that was a freight forwarder and uh, was uh, the official freight forwarder of the Italian Defense Ministry. So I started to travel a lot. And that is another part of the journalist career that is very, very important. When I saw or read the articles by Italian journalists speaking about the Americans, and maybe they never, they never left Italy. Or speaking about India, or speaking about uh, Pakistan or Afghanistan. Ne they never went there, they never experienced anything. How could it be possible? For me, it's uh, something that is impossible to think. And the same is for uh, uh, US uh, journalists uh, talking about things that they never, they never, <coughs> they never thought. So I I, I used this consultancy job for uh, traveling a lot, and I visit and I work in a, in a lot of different countries. And that is uh, something that is useful not only because this way you are able to talk about things that you have seen, but also because uh, uh, one of the most important problems is uh, to understand the culture of other people and uh, experience the cross-cultural problems when you go in an Asian country, what means uh, this? How, how profound do you have to, if you are young, if you are old, how to respect people, how do not tell people something that for you is normal, but for, for them is offensive. 
and also, of course, apart these particulars and the, these details, understand how the people live. When I spent uh, nearly oh, six, nine months in Vietnam, in Hanoi, and I toured all of Vietnam, I mean, I saw something that, uh, despite the fact I, I, I read uh, a lot of books about Vietnam, I could not ever, ever understood. Now I can, I can say that I know something about Vietnam of 10 years ago, of course, not now, but something of their mentality. And that was repeated in a lot of other countries where I went. And I still now know, don't stop. I don't stop to travel. I just returned from a, an investigative trip in uh, Bulgaria, in Moldova, in Ukraine. Go there instead to read uh, the mainstream people, the mainstream media talking about this poor country that uh, recovered from communist times and so and so. Actually, I saw very good things, hmm? both of the past and of the present. Hmm? So now I have a, a completely different idea. Hmm? So investigative journalism is useful also for this, for this experience. Hmm? And uh, uh, you can uh, you can see here one of the two quarterlies uh, I directed with other people for this for this uh, group mm -hmm. was called War Transfer and Trade uh, was so big uh, with full of statistics statistics and other things most of the my, of my colleagues hate statistics. Most of my editor in my life hates statistics, number. The public don't like this stuff. Uh, they are bored by this stuff. And uh, every time I clash with them, because uh, you need to put other people in the situation to judge your article and your evidence and your statements. Unfortunately, the newspapers are full of opinions, good opinion, bad opinions, who cares? I want the number, I want the statistics. I want to see if what you are saying is true or not. This is a, a, very, a very big problem. So I satisfied myself with three years or four years, I don't remember, of statistics, and that was full of, uh, of, full of uh, statistics. Unfortunately, at a certain point, I discovered that the, the, the company I was working for as a consultant, had uh, several times violated, helped to violate the uh, oil and arms embargo with uh, South, the apartheid South, South Africa at that time. So they helped the racist to stay in power. Uh, I was very outraged and very uncomfortable with my, with my job, and so I left. And my income dropped abruptly from very good pay to nearly nothing. That was one of the reasons uh, I applied to the MacArthur Foundation <laughs> for, uh, for grants, because I, I was already in the United States. I moved in the, sta in the States in 1994. And uh, uh, I, I was living very well with this very well paid uh, job. But I could not resist. I could not betray all my life, all my those uh, working for the, this guy. In the same, in the same way, I, in the same time, I became interested in this. How this guy that were supposedly, the, I mean, no, not supposedly, they, they were the official freight forward, the logistic company for the Italian defense ministry, could do this kind of thing, faking to send uh, arms uh, to, I don't know, Egypt or Israel, uh, and then diverting the ships to South Africa. Mm? All the papers were for legal destination. The reality was that they sent these ships to South Africa. Mm? Of course, they have the complicity of our secret service, of the, our defense ministry, mm? because you, you could not do this kind of stuff uh, only because you want to uh, uh, gain some money. Mm? And that at that point, I started to think that uh, arms trade, arms trafficking, was a very important issue that uh, uh, 
there were wars everywhere. In the, in the 90s, there were 50 conflicts ongoing, 50 conflicts, both international war, civil war, uh, or uh, something, something like this. And uh, if, you look, if you look at, at these uh, uh, wars, you, understand, you understood that uh, uh, maybe the arms, uh, the weapons, were already there, but who give you the ammunition? to wage a war for 10 years. No? Weapons are just a piece of, uh, of uh, wood or, or, uh, or, or steel mm, if you do not have ammunition. And so I started to think about the fact that uh, maybe by tracking the transport company who served, that served this kind of trade, you could have a, a clue on this, maybe an early warning and also follow this company. So I started project, and I apply for uh, the MacArthur Foundation grant, then plowshare funds fund me other grant, because uh, this, uh, apparently this uh, uh, very simple idea, no one was, uh, no one had uh, this idea before. For me, in my job, it was very simple. No? If you want to be, uh, if you want to know something about your competitor, you follow the transport of the goods of your competitor, and you know how much he's selling in the United States, he's selling in Asia, the number of containers. It's very simple. No? If they send this container, probably 90% of this stuff is sold, is already sold. So I apply this method to the, method to the arms trade and arms trafficking, and I started these studies, and now I I felt that uh, I have found, finally, a way to support uh, my independent work, my independent research. In the same time, I found uh, a manifesto in the sense that more than 10 years ago, they called me. They knew that I was in the United States, as I was writing this kind of stuff. And they asked for uh, articles about US foreign policy and uh, and uh, military policy and so and so on. I accepted, even if the pay was really, really and is still very, very bad. But for me, it was a, a way to publish, to have an influence on the crafting of the public opinion. That was one of my goals since the beginning. You know? I was never satisfied to publish books that no one read uh, or stay in a shelf uh, in a library. You know? I want to have an impact. Maybe, of course, each of one has, could have a very small impact, but at least an impact. So I accepted, and I started uh, to work for them, and was very satisfying, because in the previous 15 years, I, always, I, I worked in, in place where you could not tell all the truth. Instead, with the manifesto that is owned by journalists, is very progressive, uh, very open. Uh, no big companies behind uh, this uh, this uh, newspaper. No big interests. Uh, we own our newspaper, so I was very, very, very happy. They published my stuff, uh, big, uh, big stuff. And then I started to experience something that uh, I have. Uh, in some way, the duty to tell you, because uh, uh, many people working in my colleague, working in uh, commercial media or mainstream media, of course, they complain against censorship, against censorship attempts, uh, or uh, about the fact that the big guys usually in the in the same in the newspaper usually want uh, blood and uh, and. Uh, tricky stories, uh, they are not satisfied with the good analysis, no? because the, the good analysis, uh, analysis uh, do not sell too much. They have, a, they have a, we have a, an easy target for our complaints, our lamentation. No? The big guys, the money, the influence that money can buy, the corruption. And in Manifesto, there was nothing like this. but. Uh, I started to experience that uh, researching, 
good journalism, uh, evidence, statistics uh, are not popular, even in, uh, in this kind of place. Uh, I started to understand that uh, even in a friendly newspaper, friendly in the sense friendly with your idea, there are all the characters that I found in commercial mainstream media. Precisely the same. People who want to, to sell, who are concerned for selling copies. And so they ask you every kind of stupid things. I remember I, at that time they, they asked me to cover Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton, this kind of stuff. I refused. I simply refused. I, I'm not interested in this stuff. But at that time, this stuff was selling very well. So the fact that I refused to write about this kind of thing put me at odds with these people. Uh, in that time, it was uh, just the, the, the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, I was asking myself, oh, I mean, Maybe I have to, to leave this kind of job. I want to go back to research the quietness of my office. I have all my resources. No one, uh, no one pressed me to write uh, this or that. So I started to analyze uh, uh, my life as a journalist or my life as a, as a, a researcher. And uh, the worst moment in your uh, journalist life is when uh, your editor call you from the other side of the world, uh, pressing you time zones. So you, I am pers persecuted by time zones. Uh, I, I live with three watches, each indicating a different, uh, a, a different hour in a different part of the world because I, I am expecting information from certain place. I have to send information to another place. I am in the middle, and this guy have an hour to go to the press. So, of course, uh, my experience as a kid, as a liar, is rescuing me every time because I'm trying to, oh, yes, I have uh, explosive evidence. Give me five minutes. Uh, I am already, I, I have already done this stuff. Maybe there are other two-hour work, uh, but you, you are compelled to do these kind of things. And then, thinking about uh, my experience, uh, as a researcher. And at the end, uh, uh, except for the time, it's not so different because uh, you start to work at your, uh, at your book, page after page, uh, the times go on, and uh, you are very satisfied. You see the pages grow up. Then abruptly, you start to, 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 read the, that, to read an error. There is an error here, an error there. And you are not sure any. Uh, anymore that you wrote the good stuff, so you start to reviewing every, every, every page, go back, control the sources. Uh, your notes are not sufficiently clear. Uh, uh, the archive is a mess, and you start to panic. At that moment, the publisher usually called you and remember you that the deadline is already passed by you know, why, uh, a week, uh, that his uh, or her uh, is uh, planning to, to publish another book or another report before yours, and, but you desperately need the money for, for this, and, and you maybe also want uh, your book uh, out. No? And so you start again to lie. No, I am ready. It's just a moment. Uh, I'm sending you all this stuff. Uh, you, you have to appear very confident in yourself instead of, you look at your office as it's full of stuff that you have no idea what it is. <laughs> and so, this uh, juvenile experience as a liar is a very, very <laughs> helpful, probably the most helpful thing that I have <laughs> in, my, in my career. <laughs> so, uh, at the end, uh, uh, I, could not, I could not really decide what is better because uh, basically, uh, it's the same, the same stuff, even if you want, uh, if you have time, you have money, but at the end, uh, you fall in the same kind of situations, mm -hmm. except, of course, for people that are very different from me, that uh, they are very ordered people, they uh, respect the lines, they are not uh, 
easy to go into panic. There are people like this. I don't know. It's not. Uh, uh, I'm not here. This kind of guy. So uh, I have no answer. What is better to to be a researcher or a, 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 an author or a journalist? I think that uh, uh, if you are a serious researcher and author, you like to see your idea and uh, your uh, result and findings read by a lot of people. Mm. Uh, my experience as an author, I, I wrote seven books, uh, hundreds of articles, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, reports. Uh, I was never satisfied to see this report or this book in a good shelf in a, in a library or some, or maybe some peer, some expert calling me and asking stuff. No? I wanted to, to have an impact, as I, say, as I say before. So probably the best thing to do is to be both, also because you could not be a good journalist without being a, a good, uh, a good uh, researcher. At a certain point, I had the opportunity to become uh, to become uh, a consultant for uh, Amnesty, the International Secretariat of Amnesty International. They too don't, don't pay too much, but, but it's a very good cause. And so I started to collaborate with them, providing background information, and, uh, and uh, co-authored some of the report. And there is here, oh gosh, I probably am talking too much. That was published uh, uh, just in, in May, dead on time. Oh, sorry. Well, how to go back? Where? Here? No. OK. Dead on Times, Arms Transportation, Brokering, and the Threat to Human Rights. Uh, this uh, uh, 140 pages uh, report, uh, made not in the United States, was the only country in, in which this report was not reported by mainstream media, unfortunately. There are a lot against uh, what they are doing, so probably they decided it was not. Uh, but there are also a lot of stuff against Russia, against China, against uh, Europe. Uh, so, but the only place where uh, was not uh, was not uh, reviewed by in a, was the United States. But in all other countries, from India to uh, UK, the Guardian uh, in Italy, Corriere della Sera, had a very big impact. This one, of course, among people who are interested in this kind of stuff. I don't pretend that you, you uh, read uh, this. But it's uh, some, in some way very, very interesting also for people who do not. Uh, no. And uh, this, was, uh, this is uh, the last one, published in April 2006. And this, too, had a very big impact. <coughs> and uh, November 23, I will go to Brussels to give my testimony on the evidence that I gathered for this to the European Commission. So the highest level, because uh, we denounced mm, that the European country were accomplice, accomplice of this program. They failed not to be aware of these uh, extraordinary rendition programs, the so-called uh, torture flights. Now they pick up people, culprit, not culprit, whatever. Mm, in the country they were living secretly and put violating international rights, international laws, every, every kind of law, aviation laws, every kind of laws. You could not go to another country secretly, kidnap a person, and go in another third country in order to put this guy in, 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 in some jail like Egyptian, Moroccan, where they were tortured and in search of uh, of information uh, and so it's called amnesty because amnesty is uh, opposing torture in every form and for every reason. Also, we have a, an international treaty against torture and inhuman treatment. So 
is not only amnesty, it is a, an international treaty signed by, by uh, 140 countries, including Italy, including the United States. Mm -hmm. So they were supposed to admit to this law. And uh, if you want, maybe a bit later, we can talk about uh, the methods, investigative methods, to collect all this information. Mm -hmm. And the best investigative methods, at least for uh, evidence, is uh, the Freedom of Information Act that you surely know. This country, differently from Europe, has a Freedom of Information Act. You can apply, you can apply. You can send your request, for example, at the Federal Aviation Administration and tell them, I need all the flights of this aircraft with their registration number, with their manufacturing number, from 2001 to 2005. I never experienced that. After two months, they sent me CDs with all the flights I have requested. They are requested by law. And it was a very sensitive time because it was October 2005, and everyone was talking about the torture flight, the European, European involvement, and so and so. This country, differently from Europe, allowed me to have all the evidence I needed. Because uh, there is the flight logs starting from this airport, going to that airport with this kind of aircraft, and uh, the flight lasted from this and that with all the, all the evidence. And so I received 40,000 logs, 40,000 records, and I choose uh, 1,500 with a very hard work on the computer, hours and hours and hours and, and days and days. At the end, we end up with the 1,300 flights that we are surely used for this purpose. And when you have this stuff, you can present to the public. Think whatever you want about this, but don't deny that you, do, you did this because we have the evidence. This plane landed in Italy, landed in the UK, landed in France, landed in Belgium. Do not deny that you were not aware of this because flight need permission, especially to land in military airports. That was an asset that they landed in military airports. And uh, you can land in a civil airport uh, saying that you need the fuel, you are in an emergency, and they have to grant you the permission, but not in a military airport. You have to tell these people who is in bo on board, what is your mission, and so and so. So that was a very good, uh, very good report, and also uh, had a, a, very, a very large impact on, uh, on, uh, on the situation and uh, on media. Oh, ah, sorry. I wanted to show you, that is the manifesto, is a, this page two of the manifesto. You can see no, no advertisement. We have very few advertisement. And that uh, is an article divided into two articles by me on the same, on the same subject. And it was published, published in, uh, in January 2000, 2006. And in this column, you can see the right method, mm -hmm. and at that time, the editor say, no, 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 this box with all this number, ah, people don't, are not interested, and I say, no, you publish this stuff. And these are all the times they landed in each country on my records. So people can understand that this is not only guess work. Mm -hmm. I have the man, the number, and the responsibility to prove that this box is true. This box serves to assure the reader that I am not talking about my feelings or my, my thought. Uh, I am feeling about numbers mm, and statistics. And that is the proof mm, of this. Of course, you have to believe uh, on this box, but you can also ask the newspaper, OK, this is not true. Give me the proof on the basis of this box. And I have to do this kind of answer. OK, I, I took too much of your, uh, of your time, so I will uh, for sure. That is uh, uh, one of the last book, uh, The Arms Roots. Mm. 
what I can say about uh, this uh, quest for the true that was uh, the guideline of my, my life as a journalist. And uh, what I can say is uh, that uh, the quest for true is just, uh, just a journey uh, where uh, what all matters is uh, exploring. And the destination, you don't know. The destination is just not to be a journalist. Never, never try to be a career, hmm? something connected with a career. Just try, and I try to be a decent human being. Thank you.